is um, very interesting tech which has come out recently, which um, is especially very useful for, uh, I guess, startups looking to go into the regulated space, uh, which is obviously a lot more prevalent now uh, with the rise of neobanks and other financial services, fintech type companies too. Um, so I might segue into Marwan and Gerald and let them continue on with the presentation on AWS Control Tower. Cool. Thanks, Nick. Um, just a quick one. If um, if you could all mute yourself, please, during the presentation, otherwise we have some distracting background noise. So how can you mute yourself if you're in, in Google Meet? On the bottom, there is this gray bar, and there's a microphone icon. If you click it, it turns red. When it's red, you're on mute. To ask any questions during the talk, there is a chat in there, so we'll look into that from time to time as well. And otherwise, we've uh, allocated enough time at the end for questions. Okay. So what are we talking about today? It's AWS Control Tower. And before we get into it, I'll just give you a quick rundown on what you can expect over the next 20 or 25 minutes. Quick intro. Nick has done part of that before. Um, we explain why do you need a landing zone and how does a landing zone look like in AWS? That's the Control Tower. Then we look into the pricing and after that, we deep dive into a couple of those features that we bring out in the overview. Uh, then we sum up the lessons learned during the time we used Control Tower, and then we have time for questions. Okay, I start with my introduction. My name is Gerald Bachima. I'm a technical principal at Contina. I'm also an AWS Partner Network Ambassador, and as such, I'm a big cloud native advocate. So what does that mean? I'm really in favor of utilizing cloud native services rather than building everything from scratch. That way, if you use a service, let it be a queue or something, uh, Process, business process energy and decision uh, framework, then you can actually focus on the business value rather than starting everything from scratch. And I hand over to Marwan. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Marwan. Uh, I'm a technical principal as well at Contino. Um, I'm an advocate for all things AWS, DevOps and security. Uh, I've got a bit of a networking and security background. Um, and I'm a proud father of two. WS Ambassador. <laughs> I'll add that to general. Cool. I'll start with why do we need a landing zone and there's several reasons. So from an enterprise point of view or organization point of view, you want to have some governance and compliance. You have been some rules you need to adhere to because of uh, uh, regulations or because of uh, internal requirements for your security, internal cell security team has particular requirements. So things that you might need to enforce there are, for example, um, that particular business units can only nuclear services. Can you please mute yourself? There's some door buster in the background, I think. Um, so for example, you want to make sure that particular business units can only use particular services as part of the service portfolio. Then you also want to address security and connectivity requirements. So you might want to enforce password policies, for example or make sure that encryption and transit is always happening, or that you always uh, use encrypted S3 buckets, for example. Then account management is another one. You want to make sure that it's easy to create new accounts. So for example, you might want to offer self-service to the business units so they can create their own accounts in AWS. That means they can get projects started quicker. There is no provisioning time or a form they need to fill out. They can just create it themselves. But having said that, you want to put some policies in place that they can account uh, look the same and has the same security controls in place. You want to be across the cost as well. So examples there is you want to make sure that resources are not underutilized because then you want to reduce the number of resources that you use. For example, any virtual machines that you have been running, reduce the cost. You also want to have a great cost breakdown in place that's showing you the cost breakdown by business units, for example, or project codes and all the environments, development environment or production or UT. Uh, then last but not least, you also want to make sure that you have operational efficiencies. Um, what do we mean with that? So when you have your monitoring solution, for example, in place, you want to make sure that you only implement that once and that you can use it across the whole portfolio of your applications, no matter if that's logging or notifications. Um, yeah, all of that. Okay, next one. How do we? How does 
the landing zone actually look like in AWS? So the answer is it is controlled tower. It's a fairly new product. It only came out last year it's in Sydney only uh, since last month. And the way you create controlled tower, we'll look into that, is it's following best practices. It's an automated setup. It creates several accounts to have your segregation of duty in place. The most important account on the top is the master account that actually initiates the whole automated creation of the control tower. It, it does that by using stack sets. So stack sets is a cloud formation template where you can control cloud formation templates across regions and different accounts. It sets up your own AWS organizations. So that's, that's your organization that you can define in organizational units. And you step for security controls, and it has um, single sign-on enabled out of the box. Uh, the other accounts that I created are log archiving account and audit account. So why do we need separate accounts for that? You want to have the log files in a separate account locked away in case one of your application accounts is being compromised, then you still have the, the full log file integrity in. You can still see what happened. Uh, audit accounts that segregation of duty, you want to give your internal or external auditors some um, read-only permissions to see um, if you comply with their rules. Okay, so if we look at the control tower features, this is just the overview. We then later on dive into uh, each of those features in more detail. So what, what do you get with the landing zone? So it's a multi-account setup, we've just gone through that. And it, Account Factory. The Account Factory makes it easy to create new AWS accounts. Um, it standardizes the whole provisioning process for new accounts. And yeah, it's self-service. That's a good thing. So you turn your infrastructure team or whoever would usually um, provision the account. Uh, they don't have to do it, so that means there is no bottleneck. Control Tower also comes with guardrails. So there are preventive guardrails. Those are the ones that prevent users from doing something. So that means you can't even do it. Whereas the detective ones, they tell you something happened that it's not aligned with your uh, with your rules, but you still you let users do it. For example, you might want to have uh, a bit more permissions or a bit more relaxed on the developers so they can still do the stuff without stopping them, but then you can advise them, please use a different machine image, for example. Military uh, guardrails and optionals, we'll go into that into more detail later on. Um, another thing is you get a dashboard which shows you the number of your accounts, that's your AWS accounts and your business units that you use. And it also shows you the guardrails that you have in place, that means they're activated, and the ones that have non-compliant resources. Okay, I'll go through these step, setup steps now. It's a fairly simple process, really. Um, first of all, you need one account to get everything started. That's the master account. So if you don't, and I would recommend start with the clean slate account, but there's nothing in there, just use one from scratch. And um, the procedure there is you set up a new account. It's the typical thing when you set up an AWS account, you need to leave your details, payment uh, details as well. And then there's this phone verification. You can either get a text message or a phone call, and then you need to validate that code that's being given to you. Um, so once that's done, you have set up one account. That's the one account that will be turned into a master account later on. So you log on, then you need to select a region. So Control Tower is currently available in five regions. So you need to select the region where you want to set it up, Sydney being one of the regions. Um, then you will need two further email addresses, one for the log archive account and the second and the third one for the audit account. Um, a best practice there is to use email addresses that are not personalized. So otherwise, if you have um, IT staff leaving the organization, you have an issue if they're the root account holder. So Use, use um, a distribution list account for that. Um, the setup process is quick. It's one hour. It's very, yeah, it's very unspectacular, really. I'll, I'll show you some screenshots later on. Uh, while you go through the setup process, AWS gives you a couple of guidances on what not to do. Uh, most important thing there is don't change or delete any resources that might be created by Control Tower. Uh, that's especially for any IEM, so identity and access management resources. Don't delete any roles. Um, then also, any uh, there's some things that are now being managed with Control Tower rather than with AWS organizations. So Control Tower turns into a source of proof. For example, if you want to create new AWS accounts um, or move accounts 
within your uh, OUs, then turn to that by organizations to that by control tower. Same thing, don't delete any OUs organizations because you won't be able to provision a new account to this OU with a control tower account factory. Okay, so yes, a couple of screenshots. That's the cloud formation template that's being kicked off. Uh, on the status, you can see all the resources that have been created and are complete. Blue the ones that are in progress. These are the stack sets. So as I said, stack sets is a construct where you can deploy a cloud formation template across regions and accounts. Uh, they're all running fairly smoothly through. And there's not much to see. So when, when I'm comparing it with the previous version, which was called AWS Landing Zone, there was a lot going on in code pipeline. And you can see a lot going on. Uh, having said that it also took four hours. So now it's, there's not much happening and it only takes one hour. So once the setup is complete, you can see the dashboard. That's what, what you get afterwards. You know, some OUs are set up. You have those three accounts created. Then the preventative guardrails that are in place and the detective guardrails. So we look into the pricing now. Um, in a nutshell, control tower doesn't cost anything, but you're being charged for the resources that are created by control tower. So that's mainly um, around AWS config, we get into that in the price example. So we, we use an example here. Uh, and to come up with numbers, we just use those assumptions. So you're, you have an organization, that organization needs 10 accounts in total. It needs 15 resources per account and that across four regions. We have five strongly recommended detective guardrails that we use and they are being invoked 5,000 times per month. And the last assumption is each of those resources is being changed 20 times per month. Yeah. So with those numbers, we can now come up with uh, the costing. It's one account factory portfolio that we use, that's to create new accounts. Uh, that costs us $5 per month. Then the preventative guardrails are free and the mandatory det detective guardrails are free as well. So AWS config, that's the thing that costs a bit. So what does AWS config do? AWS config monitors and manages, or doesn't manage, monitors and the records all the configuration changes, changes in your account. <laughs> so if basically whenever you change a configuration, it might be your, uh, you create a new subnet, for example, that's being recorded. So with 12,000 configuration items, you're being charged $36 per month. And with 25,000 rule evaluations per month, you're being charged $25. And then there is a one-off config initial recording fee. So that is when you turn AWS config on, it creates an inventory. And to record all that, there's a logging going on. You're being charged a one-off fee of $12, roughly. So with that scenario, it brings us up to $66 per month. That's not a lot, really. And I would really recommend to turn AWS config on. It's a great tool. Uh, as I said, it gives you the whole inventory and really helps you to see what's going on in your account. And you can set up compliance rules in there as well. Okay, we start on to the first feature, and that's the account factory. So what can you do with the account factory? You can manage the whole life cycle of your accounts. So that's from creating a new account, it offers this self-service functionality. And we can see that on the left screenshot there, enroll account, um, you create that by giving it a logical name. That's your display name, you need an account email, so that's the email address for your root account holder, and then a single sign-on username as well. And you can allocate that account to a business unit, that's your OU. Um, you can manage the whole life cycle with account factory, so you can move an account to different OUs, and you can also close an account. That's on the right-hand side, that screenshot, you can modify your IP ranges. So the default size of uh, a VPC the internet facing uh, VPC 16 slash 16, so that's just 65,000 IP addresses. Uh, in that example that we can see, I modified that and went from a slash 16 to slash 18, and that's really smooth. So you can change side ranges on the fly, it's really handy. And you can allocate VPCs to different regions. The ones we see here is US East, <coughs> that's East 1, East 2, West Island, and Sydney. And another nice feature is um, on the top of the screenshot, we can see you can actually toggle if um, 
the subnet should be internet facing or not if you allow it actually so you can disallow it might be um, another compliance requirement that you have okay i've gone through that so now it's time where i'll hand over to marvin and i'll stop my sharing all right uh let me just uh present my screen bear with me for a second as i uh put this on and continue from where <coughs> job left off um can you go see my screen at the moment yes all right so um as joe touched on um the first feature is the account factory and the account factory is the ability to package an account and uh, allow your um the rest of your um users or your um um, organization departments to roll out their, their own account, but how does that fit into the entire compliance and uh, governance model? Um, we, we're looking at Control Tower um, as a landing zone uh, provider to us in AWS. However, um, there's a lot more that comes to it. So when you deploy Control Tower by, the, by default, um, you get a well architected landing zone and a well architected landing zone is a landing zone that meets aws's um, definition of well architected um, um, <clears throat> landing zone or uh, workload um, which means you are already compliant um, and you get three accounts by default which is the master account the audit account and the login account each serves a different purpose and we'll dive into those uh, a little bit less however the landing zone comes PCI and HIPAA and so on, um, as well as um, it's compliant at an OU level, um, which means every time you um, add an account to an OU, it's completely compliant. Um, now, something to mention here um, uh, is not IRM certified. However, all the services that are underneath it are. So <clears throat> if you're working with a government body that requires IRM certification, um, it's still an option. Uh, there may be a need to actually take your certification one level up uh, working with AWS. So what are the guardrails? Um, those guardrails are, the, the guardrails that Control Tower provides you are at three different levels, um, or as AWS calls them, guidance. Guardrails, um, and in AWS's uh, language, those are enforced. You can't turn them off. So as soon as you um, account into Control Tower or you add an OU, um, those guardrails are automatically deployed into um, that OU or that, card, that um, account. You've got recommended or strongly recommended um, guardrails and you've got optional and um, these are called elective. <clears throat> now, there's, there's a lot of guardrails in there. Um, just by default, um, the mandatory ones are on, and those are about 22 or 24 guardrails. And those are just by default automatically turned on. So I'm not gonna dive into all of them. I'm gonna talk about um, their behaviors. There's two type of guardrail behaviors. There's prevention or detection. Two guardrails have an implicit, uh, sorry, an explicit deny or allow for certain actions. Um, so for example, um, an explicit deny of deletion of log archives. So all my all my logs are being streamed into a log archive account, and there's an explicit deny to stop people from deleting those logs, or there's an explicit allow to turn on and um, uh, enable the encryption for these logs at rest, um, which is uh, by the same logic. Um, when logs are streamed into that log account, they are encrypted by default. Some of the detective guardrails, um, uh, in in a sense that this allows, for example, um, public read access to log archives. So if there's an attempt to read logs from the archive, um, you will be notified as such. Um, we touched on the dashboard, but to look further into it and what it provides us. So at a high level, once you um, deploy control tower and you see, you get a big dashboard um, But to make more sense of it. So at the top level, you look at the dashboard um, and it gives you a bit of an environment summary. Um, but before that, it gives you some quick actions. For example, this is where you add an organization unit. This is where you um, review users and, and access for SSL, so on and so forth. But the elements underneath it are really important. 
an environment summary. You get to see how many OUs you have, how many accounts you have, um, and um, you can see which account is enrolled in which OU once you dig into them. Um, you get a guardrail summary, which is, um, these are the ones by default enabled. We didn't turn anything on for this presentation. Um, so there's um, 20 preventative and two detective. You get non-compliant resources. Um, this, is, this is exceptionally important. The reason behind it is, is, for example, you can turn on a guardrail that says anyone who is um, an IM user has to have an MFA but someone went and created a user and um, did not turn on an FA for them. Um, as soon as that user is created, um, you'll get that um, compliance in there. So, so you'll get that um, non-compliant resource in there, you'll have it on. Um, enrolled accounts, as, as I said, you get to see every account, what value they belong to, and if they're compliant or not. Um, the next feature is going to be SSO. Um, SSO is a uh, sort of an access um, thing, bit like your, um, for example, your Citrix presentation layer or any other presentation layer that enables you to land into a page and then from there you access the rest of the accounts, um, like an Okta, for example. Um, and this is also very important from a compliance perspective. The reason behind it is you get a configurable identity source. So. I can still point my SSL applications to my on-prem and Eva um, that's providing some authentication, or I can um, enforce MFA. Um, enforcing MFA means um, if you're going into my SSL page accounts or these applications that are talking SAMLs, you still have to use an MFA token. And you also get a customizable URL, which is really cool because I'm terrible with addresses and I'm terrible with um, placeholders as well. <laughs> um, we, we spoke about the two different accounts that you get, other than a billing account, the master account, which is also your billing account. Accounts. Um, one is audit and one is logging. Um, the audit account streams all your configuration changes into a centralized account where um, you get a representation of all the changes to the environment done um, and those are accessible programmatically um, well, take for example someone goes and removes a file rule or adds a, uh, a file rule that opens up the environment to the world um, you've got a guardrail to stop that but if you didn't have that guardrail where the audit is going to tell you who did it and at what time you also get a log archive account and that log archive account also um, provide, provides the same purpose, which is streaming all the logs into one account. And those logs are, you cannot delete them, they're automatically encrypted, so on and so forth. The looking at doing at the moment is deploying an SS firehose into the log account and push logs to a same solution that is uh, remote for us to do more um, security analytics on these logs. We haven't done that yet. Uh, judging by blog post before, it's probably possible. Um, lessons learned. Now, we've been playing with this for a while. We haven't deployed it yet into production for a customer. We've deployed the previous version, which is the AWS Standing Zone. Um, because it's recent, uh, recently um, um, available in AWS APAC uh, region. Um, thing that we noticed is once you deploy control tower into an environment, um, rolling it backwards is quite a task. Um, you got to roll all the, um, the um, stacks and then provide a lot of variables and then roll the stack sets. And um, you're much better off just nuke the account, delete it completely and um, start fresh with another account elsewhere. Mm. Account factory only provides you a slash 16 sider. Um, uh, depending on how you look at it. Personally, I see that as a good. I do not want to see an account with more than 64 or 65,000 IP addresses um, uh, from a blast radius perspective. But yeah, it's, uh, it's a matter of perspective how you deploy your um, environment. Um, Control Tower does not provision transit gateway, egress gateway, that gateway, or a shared networking account. This is important. Um, 
if you're deploying everything into your private subnets, you have to go do still do that work uh, manually. If you're provisioning a hub as topology, you still have to do that manually. So this is quite important. Um, consider um, your topology once you deploy it. So I would personally provision a shared networking account. Um, integration with security hub and network manager is not yet enabled by default. Um, this is not necessarily an issue um, you can still go and turn them on manually. So if we have those uh, turned on as an option while we deploy, not a great problem. Um, one of the things that's a big gotcha, if you're deploying OUs, for example, at a department level, and you deploy sub OUs that says production, TE, non-prod, etc., um, nested OUs are not displayed on the console, and they're only available programmatically or as code. Um, you're better off um, changing email, uh, you're better off removing accounts than changing email addresses for accounts. They generate random errors. Um, but the key takeaway here is root users and IAM administrators can bypass guardrails. Um, if you turn on a guardrail, that's going to cause a problem for you or that has caused a problem for you. Um, you may be able to work around it and look in as a root or as an IAM user and, and uh, work, your, work your way around that. Um, that takes me to the last slide that I've got. Um, right now, we open the floor for any questions, um, Q and A's. So if you have any questions, please pop them in the chat. I can see there's a lot of messages, so I'm going to try to catch them. Um, yeah, so please, any question, um, pop them in the chat. <coughs> Can you provision VPC peering with control tower? Um, no, you get a default landing zone. You can add to the stack set once you turn it on. Um, you can add a, um, so you can add a uh, transit gateway or a VPCD or use a Lambda that does this for you. Um, so this, you can do that, but it's not turned on by default. It's gonna be a next step thing. It's on that note, and also with the previous product, the AWS landing zone, there was a fourth account being created that was called the shared account. That's the one where you would set up all the connectivity getting into your um, into your landing zone. So no matter if it's VPN or direct connect. So that account is not created anymore. So you need to create it separately. I see that in, there's probably some use cases where this is an advantage. So you might not always go to full heavyweight uh, deployment approach. Where, you, where everything is deployed for you in that gateway, but you also pay for those elastic IP addresses. So I see that as an advantage. You can do that later on. Can I migrate existing organizations to Control Tower? Only if you've deployed the organization using the AWS landing zone 2.1 and above from memory. Um, there's a, there's a level of compatibility for the AWS landing zone that you have deployed. Uh, if you've used the previous product, AWS landing zone, you can migrate that into control tower. Um, Gerald, do you remember which uh, what the, the version number from memory? It's 2 or 2.1, but you can still upgrade to that version anyway. Uh, I thought it's just upgrade to version 2.3, I'm not 100% sure. Yeah, so you can, uh, you need to be on a certain version and upgrade your way to the latest version and then from there, take it into control tower. But if you built your own custom landing zone, um, you can't. Can you bring existing accounts into landing zone? Um, you detach the account from the organization and you can bring it into the landing zone. If anybody wants to unmute and ask Gerald or Marlon or, or anybody a question as well, feel free to unmute. And just use the chat. Um, on that note, I did that recently where we detached an account from an existing AWS organization. Uh, the way, so if you create your AWS your account on that AWS organization, you don't need all the details that you a brand new account, like your uh, uh, credit card details, for example, and your technical contact. So that's something you need to do as an interim. You then need to add that information, and then once the the first that once the account is detached from the organization, you can then reattach it to your new control tower. Seems like we're still going into cloud security posture management building almost. Indeed, um, abstracting everything in, uh, in favor of a single tool environment. Um, 
One tool, to question from... One tool to rule them all. <laughs> Absolutely. One tool to bring them together and bind them. Um, another question from Nick. Is it LAC, uh, LAC Able? Can you please elaborate on that? You're welcome to go off mute and uh, elaborate on the question. Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, Marwan. Okay. So, basically, the question is um, uh, the control tower. Does does it give does it open up the APIs and all the infrastructure as code provisions that you integrate into your CI/CD? Because I think we had some issues with that with uh, with the landing zone in the landing zone world because it was. Uh, not great at that. Um, ha has that been fixed in the control tower? Good question. So the deployment of control tower itself is not available via API. Once the environment is deployed, it is... So it's essentially quick ops, right? Yeah, um, ju just the deployment of control tower itself. But once everything is up and running, um, you've got access to the platformation stacks and you can actually do everything and anything um, via APIs and um, programmatically. Okay. Um, and the question was about SSO. Uh, you yep. touched upon that. Um, and you said there's some automation and some pre-canned SSO connectors that are available. Um, how do you feel like there, there there's enough work done in that space, or there's still a lot of manual, I guess, teaching that you have to do there? <laughs> Good question as well. Um, the additional work that needs to be done. So SSO, pointing SSO to a, a, an identity source or pointing SSO to um, a, uh, a, let's say, a SAML provider, an IGP, um, that's not a great, uh, that, that's not a, a difficult task. Um, the bit that is a bit lacking is the granularity in the SSO environment for um, authorization. So authentication is fine, right? It's the authorization layer that is not very granular. You get um, six or seven or eight roles by default, and you have to deal with those. So you get like an account administrator or control tower administrator, so on and so forth. Um, that could do with a lot more details at this stage. Great. Wasn't this cloud thing supposed to be easy? <laughs> uh, guys, I've got a quick question here. Um, listen, you know, I'm, I've got a requirement for a lot of SCP across my organization. I want to roll that into CloudFormation template. Has anybody got any recommendations about how to scan the CloudFormation templates for potential security issues? Thank you. There is a tool called Macy. It's not available in Sydney, so that's an AWS service that scans for PII, personal information. Uh, I looked at there's several open source Keys. tools that are available to scan CloudFormation and Terraform templates to achieve that exact yeah. requirement. I'm yeah. guessing you're looking for CloudFormation or Terraform templates that you're uploading to Git and maybe they have a security group that, you know, SSH open the world or whatever other security misconfiguration. Um, Aqua Security have a great one. It's called Classboy. It's an open source tool. Oh, yeah. Okay. And, and uh, worst case scenario, hook your environment into Dom9 and see what, what comes out. <laughs> Dom9 is nice, yeah. Just draw a bit. Perfect. <laughs> all the cloud native services, so it works for GCP and s as well. And uh, in AWS, for example, it uses services like Config. Thanks, guys. Appreciate that. I'll get back to what I was up to earlier now. Jim. No worries. <laughs> I, love, I love your mask, man. <laughs> <laughs> You're Alan and Marvin. Thank you. I got a quick question. So, as part of Cloud Native, a lot of our developers have been using multiple tools, not just AWS. We got a combination of key clock, tables, or whatever Cloud Native tools are available, right? So, how would you really, I mean, I hope you might be having the same challenge as well. That it's not just AWS resources, right? What you have shown is is easy when you have all AWS resources, but if it's non AWS resources, how do you really manage this? Having the guardrails set up and. Um, Joe, do you want to take that one? Uh, well, it's yeah, it's great. 
for your AWS resources. If you need something that is, um, yeah, not AWS or whatever on on prem, all those combinations, you yeah, you need to look into other tools. Yeah. It doesn't solve every problem. It solves a couple of use cases, really nice use cases, and that is great in learning. So if you if you're hybrid cloud or a single cloud, great. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, because that, that's a challenge because that is actually stopping us to take the full benefits of the control tower because you have four different tools to manage this account management and card rights. I think that's where we're struggling. And there's no out of the box tools available on the market which can manage all these hybrid clouds as of now, which have matured in us. On the, on the connectivity side, you can get started by, by saying, okay, where do I, I, I have a single tool that is an egress monitor or an ingress monitor, and then from there, um, I can use my transit gateway or VPCs to plummet all my traffic throughout that tool. But on the DevOps side, it's it's a bit more, it's a bit more difficult. Um, any other questions? Yeah, one more from me. Um, so what sector, what market do you feel this is geared towards? Because it, it seems like the enterprises that already have an existing account topology would probably have trouble retrofitting this. Uh, do you think this is, I guess, better tailored or a small and medium business maybe? Um, very good question. We've uh, we've been trying to position this uh, as a uh, solution that is more enabled for. Um, well, at first, it's 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 provided to you for emerging tech and so on and so forth, but it's maturing very very rapidly. Um, so if you look at um, what it's gone through and what it is now, it's becoming a lot more um, suffering to enable you to deploy this at an enterprise scale but um you also have to be a little realistic with the requirements from that from that perspective um so if your requirements are going to cause um, going to need 30 or 40 days worth of development to deploy landings on then are the requirements really um realistic it also depends on what your current situation is so i, I see great for let's say tier two Suppliers, not, not, not the maybe big, big enterprise. And you, uh, don't forget, you always need to have your customization on top of your control tower deployment, regardless. Um, but if you are changing your run path, I'm not the, the, the provider that is managing your cloud environment, you usually need to do it anyway because to change ownership, then it's probably a good time to look into control tower as well. Right. And is there still any reason to deploy landing zone as opposed to control tower? Um, to AWS landing zone? No, I wouldn't. No. So, no. if you're in a region like Sydney where we already have control tower, definitely not. Yeah. A a a a AWS control tower is the actual product that is um, replacing AWS landing zone. No longer exists, uh, or will no longer exist. There are, supposedly there will be um, migration scripts coming out from AWS to here where you can upgrade from landing zone to control tower. Cool, cool. All right. Um, since we don't have any other questions left, I will hand the microphone back to Matt and Nick. Guys, look, um, so Gerald and, and Marlon, Thanks for those amazing talks about uh, you know getting started with foundational AWS security. Uh, personally, I am <laughs> I'm very glad that AWS have these uh, service offerings because it means that um, well I don't have to write a whole bunch of Python or GoLang anymore. Um, it was the case a few years ago. <laughs> to everybody that joined and has listened to these talks. Thank you so much for participating. Um, really, really, really happy with, with this turnout. And um, we'd also be really keen to hear your feedback afterwards. I know we've already gone through the, thanks Stephen Willis, you're a visionary, uh, we've gone through the Q&A. Um, if anybody has any uh, generic feedback, um, 
either on the format or you know the talks. Of course, you can get in contact with Gerald and Marlon. Um, and on a side note, we're looking for people to speak. And um, you know, look, uh, I know that um, people are a little bit more flexible now. So if anybody out there in the audience is prepared and willing to do a talk, reach out to Nick or myself. Um, we would love to have you. And uh, on that note, stay tuned. I think that this has been pretty successful. And so we'll go on. Um, Nick, over to you. Thank you.